So this is overview of the open source Vulkan driver for Raspberry Pi 4 by Diago Toral. Diago, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, my name is Diago Toral. I work as a software engineer for Igalia, and uh, for a bit over a year now, I've been involved with the Raspberry Pi graphics stack, and um, initially with the OpenGL stack, which was the only one available. Uh, but more recently, I've been working on bringing up Vulkan for the Raspberry Pi 4. And that is what this presentation is going to cover. So I hope you enjoy that. Uh, this is a list of contents that I prepared for this presentation. I would like to start with a quick recap or a, a quick insight into the development story behind this driver, uh, mostly uh, giving you a view of the main milestones we went through during development as well as some of the things that we, uh, uh, some, some of the ways in which we approach the development from the, from the start of the, of the process. Um, then we would like to discuss a little bit about the current state of the driver, what's, what's currently implemented, uh, what is working, what we have tested so far, and what you can expect from it. Um, uh, then I would like to also discuss some of the implementation challenges that we went through. As you know, Vulkan being a multi-platform API, there is always certain aspects that you need to consider more carefully when you implement in a particular platform. So I would like to give some, some insights into uh, what we uh, had to do specifically for V3D. Uh, I think that might be of interest for some of the more, um, uh, for the people who are more involved with, with GPU drivers out there. Uh, and then I would like to, of course, cover the future plans that we may have for the driver, uh, both in the short term, as of in this year, as well as uh, in future years, if possible. And last, I would like to make a note on how we can enable developers to contribute. I know that when the Raspberry Pi uh, Vulkan effort was announced, there was a lot of excitement around it, and there were a few people who were interested in, in helping us bring in Vulkan to Raspberry Pi 4. So, I think when we started this effort, uh, the scenario for allowing uh, other people to contribute to the driver was not optimal. And there were a lot of challenges involved with that, which I'll discuss a bit later. But I think we are now in a much better position to enable um, other people to have a great experience contributing to this driver. And I would also uh, like to talk a, a little bit about how we can do that. Okay, so let's get started then, talking a little bit about the development story for this driver. Um, so first, the code name for the driver is V3DB. So not obviously not a very original uh, name if you are familiar with uh, previous drivers for Raspberry Pi boards. Um, this is basically taking the OpenGL uh, driver name and just adding the V for Vulkan at the end. Uh, hopefully that will make it easy to identify for Raspberry Pi users. Uh, we did discuss some more uh, original, maybe, or different uh, names for the driver in the beginning, but eventually we thought this was the best option. Um, so this is being developed as a uh, Mesa driver. Um, development is not happening in the upstream Mesa repository, but in a fork. We did this for our own convenience, mostly. Um, when you are bringing up a new driver from scratch, there is a lot of moving pieces throughout uh, most of the development a lot of things that we then would like to come back to uh, and amend in the commit history and things like that, which is obviously not the, the right workflow for working directly with, within Mesa upstream. So um, uh, I think this was useful to us uh, and when, we, when it's the right time to, to merge the driver or to propose to merge the driver upstream, I think we, we would be able to propose something that makes more sense from, from the point of view of the history of the development. Um, um, we are actually at a point now where I think we are close to do that. And I will discuss a little bit more about that later in the presentation. So um, as a Mesa driver, uh, the uh, our work leverages some other parts of infrastructure in Mesa, and notably the Vulkan uh, Windows system integration bits that were developed originally for Anvil and then abstracted away so that it could be reused with RadB. We, of course, use that. Um, we also continue uh, reusing the V3D uh, backend compiler for from the OpenGL driver, which is based on NIR. 
uh, we just expanded it as it was necessary to cover some of the Vulkan specific features and, and semantics. Um, and uh, of course, in this process, we also uh, reuse the Spear V uh, translator, translator layer to near. Um, and this is something that may or may not continue to happen in the future. But at this point, we are also using the same kernel interface that we use with the OpenGL driver. Uh, this uh, initially, this was um, decided to make things easy for us, as we would be able to just focus on the user space side of the driver. Um, but it has been working really well. Um, of course, this may impose some limitations for us uh, that we may want to sense a little bit more in detail in the future to see if we can, um, if, if there is gains for us in possibly uh, having a dedicated uh, interface for Vulkan or maybe extend the existing OpenGL one for Vulkan. Uh, we still need to assess whether the, what would be the advantage for that, so how much gains we can get for that. But for now, at least, uh, we are using the same kernel interface, and that has made things a lot easier for us in some ways. So uh, this slide presents a bit of a timeline of the development. Um, so uh, we started developing the driver sometime by the end of November, I believe. Um, I think it was not until the beginning of December that we started like fully working full time on it. Um, so the developers are Alejandro Peñera and myself. Uh, we have been working full time pretty much since that moment on this on this project. If you have been following the news uh, around the Raspberry Pi, you probably know that the Raspberry Pi Foundation announced uh, this Vulcan driver effort uh, by the beginning of February. And that was after we achieved the first milestone for the project that we had. And, and that was getting this triangle demo that we use in that post, uh, where we basically got that first vertical slice of the driver working and rendering something on, on the actual hardware. Uh, since January to May has been basically a few months of just working on iteratively adding more and more, and more features to the driver to a point where we thought we had something that started to be useful. Um, I was at that point that we uh, wanted to move development to an open repository and give users a taste of, of what we had developed so far. And in order to do that, we wanted to give them something that they could you know, test on their Raspberry Pi 4s. And um, it just happened that uh, Sasha Williams has this uh, great repository of, of demos for Vulkan, uh, which are very popular in the Vulkan ecosystem. And it was then, I think that was the first time that we actually tried to run uh, any actual Vulkan code that was not just a small CTS test or, or some small sample that we developed ourselves to, to aid in development. And it was really nice to see that there were many demos that were already working. Uh, so we used that to, to go ahead with moving to an open repository and give uh, people access to the, to the, to the driver code and, and point them to this demo so that they could just play a little bit with the driver. I think that was very, very nice. Um, then when we made that move, we also um, kind of shared a few uh, notes on what we were planning to do in the upcoming months. And one of the points I made then was that I did not want to work on enabling any games yet. And the reason for that was we wanted to focus on getting a conformant Vulkan 1.0 implementation, both conformant and complete, of course. Um, and because, you know, um, if you start trying to figure out why a game doesn't work or doesn't run correctly too early, you are just going to have a very hard time. Uh, it's a lot easier to just fix most, as most bugs as you can just by uh, fixing more self-contained CTS tests. Um, I thought that that was the, the right thing to do, and I still think. However, just as I as I made that that um, that plan, a colleague of mine asked me whether we were able to run Quake at that point, and we were not able because we didn't support compute shaders at that moment. Uh, but we we checked Quake two, and it, it just happened that it was using right the, it, it, a subset of the Vulkan API that we were implemented. Um, so it was too tempting not to not to give it a try. And when I did, I, I found that it, it was not working. It, it actually not it didn't even start. It just hanged the GPU, which was very frustrating, to be honest. Um, so I decided it was maybe worth my while to spend a few weeks trying to 
uh, get it to work to understand what was going on. Um, since at, at, at the end of the day, it was using features that we were supposed to work. Um, and we did that for VKQuake 2, and then in parallel, we were continuing developing features for things, including compute shaders. So that also enabled us to run Quake. Uh, and then we also saw that we were able to run Quake 3, but it required a couple of optional features that we also implemented. So long story short, in, in a span of over three, maybe four weeks, we we implemented support for all these games. Um, and then uh, we also, for the first time, I think during development, we got a real test for performance. Um, and we found that it wasn't really good at that point. Uh, not unexpectedly, though, because we knew we were not taking care of some of the basic performance enablement in the driver uh, up to that point. So we used that opportunity to do that. And, and we got all the games to run very smoothly on, on the Pi 4. Um, and then from that point uh, onwards, I thought I th we just focused on getting the remaining set of features to, to work. I think we uh, achieved that by August. Uh, by the end of August, I think we finished with multi-sampling and, and robust buffer access, which I think were the only ones that were missing at that point. And I think at this point, we have a, a minimal Vulkan 1.0 implementation uh, running and um, we are focusing on, on getting better pass rate and, on CTS. OK, so as I said before, our first milestone was to get something to run on hardware. For us, this was very important. We didn't want to start building a lot of infrastructure for the driver and then have problems to actually get to to uh, get basic things working. Um, so as you know, when you're bringing up a new driver from scratch, there is a lot of pieces, of pieces that need to work together correctly for you to be able to put pixels on the screen. We needed to, or we wanted to prioritize getting that, that done right. So that kind of vertical slice of the driver working. And then once we got that in January, we moved on to just a more iterative uh, feature development where we would just choose something that was not implemented yet, and we would implement that in the driver. And the idea with this was to use uh, the Vulkan conformance test suite that Kronos developed to, to guide our uh, development efforts. Uh, so basically, this, for those of you who don't know, this is a huge uh, test suite that has hundreds of thousands of tests for testing everything that, can, that has to do with Vulkan. And um, this is used for conformance, uh, but also it's very useful for developing drivers, right? As it gives you the sample test that you need to uh, check your, your own feature development as you, as you uh, bring them into your driver. Um, so of course, there is some time before between the moment in which you get that first triangle and the moment in which you are ready to start running CTS tests, because the CTS assumes that you have a a full driver at the end of the day and every test assumes that certain functionality is there and so you have to make sure that you have at least this fundamental uh, pieces of, of functionality in your driver to start enabling cts coverage uh, but once you get there um, you you can just start using cts to test everything that you do and that was very very useful to us uh, the other nice thing about this process is that at the same time, we had other people at Igalia who was working on improving the CTS coverage. And we were in an excellent position as, uh, as we were developing this new driver to identify things where the CTS coverage was not great, uh, particularly for our platform. Uh, so we had this nice ongoing discussion with this other team at Igalia where we could just tell them, OK, for this particular feature that we have implemented, we are seeing the CTS coverage might be missing something here. Uh, and, and this ended up improving the CTS coverage over time as our, our colleagues would then go and, and implement new tests for this, which I think was, was really nice. So um, another thing that we did during development, uh, we were very worried about uh, regression testing. Um, but here we wanted to sort of try to strike a good balance between um, um, having good coverage uh, to prevent any regressions, but at the same time, having something that didn't take too long to execute because we didn't we did want to be able to run this uh, very frequently, even multiple times a day as we made progress with, with development. So we use a parallel DQP runner for this because it allows us to run multiple tests in parallel, as you probably know. Uh, and the other thing that we did is that we, as we were growing our feature set, we would select 
a, a subset of the CTS tests that we were passing with each new feature development that we added to the to the driver, and and just select a subset that we thought was meaningful to check um, uh, for regressions, but at the same time that it wasn't too large to uh, have a huge uh, execution penalty. Uh, and to give you a, an, a sense for what we settled with, right now we are passing about a bit over 100,000 tests uh, of the CTS, and we're using about 10% of that for this subset that we use for regression testing. And this has been, has been working really great for us. We can run these tests very quickly every day, and we have got like maybe 95% of our regressions during development with this system. Uh, of course, as, as our uh, driver progressed and got more mature, we were also able to start running the full CTS. The running times got shorter, and also uh, they were stable enough because when you have a half-developed driver, you can easily run into all sorts of troubles, uh, including GPU hands, so you don't want that, right? But as we mature, we started to do this as well and catch any regressions that were not caught previously by this uh, subset regression testing that we had. But as I said, this was rarely the case that we that we ran into problems. Uh, another thing that we did that I think was useful was to this kind of assert everywhere philosophy that we had. Uh, so this was not just for uh, preconditions on, on the, the Vulkan API states explicitly, but also for things that we assumed during development, things that we were new were not completely implemented, uh, paths that were not existing, were not like everything we would assert there uh, with the idea that uh, at any point, any test, anything that we tested that uh, would hit something that we knew in advance was not fully there, uh, would assert and crash early rather than maybe continue through it and lead to a GPU hand or some other obscure incorrect rendering or, or failing test that would be much more difficult to then track down uh, to the real problem. Uh, we got a lot of things with this, even for uh, CTS, when we were running CTS, we would find that we were running CTS tests to test a specific feature, and some of them maybe would crash early because they were using a feature we were not aware of they needed. Um, and it's very nice to just see a crash immediately telling you that the crash is because of that, and, and, and you don't have to go in and see what the hell is going on. Uh, and the other thing that we did, uh, especially during the last uh, few months of the development, was to try to keep people updated on the progress through developer developer blog posts. I guess some of you may have seen us um, doing that. Uh, I think it's a nice way to keep people informed about progress. All right, so um, moving on and uh, to describing the current state of the driver. So as I already said, we think that we are now at the point where we have a, a minimal Vulkan 1.0 implementation. Uh, Vulkan comes with a lot of optional features. We do implement a bunch of these, but we have tried not to, to go overboard. So there are a lot of optional features that I think we want to implement that are not there. Uh, just yet. Um, then there is, of course, a lot of uh, extensions uh, on top of Oka 1.0 that we have not implemented that we probably should. Um, um, but at least we have this Oka 1.0 uh, minimal feature set there, uh, I believe. Um, our focus right now, as I said, is um, getting all those CTS tests to pass. Right now, we are passing around 110,000 tests, and we only have 20 test fails right now. So we are actually pretty close to 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 be conformant. Uh, so I hope we can start moving uh, things for that real soon. Uh, we haven't done much real world testing with the driver yet. We have been mostly uh, testing through w the driver with CTS tests and some samples that we write now and then. Uh, the only real testing we did was with the Quake games, as I mentioned before. Uh, we know that they all the uh, three classic games for Quake are, are running. Uh, we also know that some people have been playing Open Arena, which is based on the Quake 3 uh, engine. Uh, and we got news back in July, I think, from um, uh, Salva from the Raspberry Pi Labs, who is has this channel where he uh, does extensive testing of a lot of games on, on the Pi and also the boards. And he tested the Vulkan, our Vulkan driver with some uh, PSP Vulkan emulator. And he reported that he had some games working already there, which was 
it's very encouraging when you are uh, in the middle of developing something and your head's down working on, on features to have someone telling you, hey, I'm testing this and I, this is already working. Um, that was really nice to hear. Uh, as we also announced through our developer blog posts, um, we also got a lot of uh, a lot of demos from Sasha Williams working. Um, we have been updating through these developer blog posts on, on this. It's another nice way to see, to visualize your development progress uh, other than just a increase in CTS pass count, right? Uh, regarding performance, uh, we haven't done much yet, as I said, uh, mostly the only performance work that we did was for the, for to get the the Quake games running smoothly. Um, we can say though that VK Quake three in particular has a both a Vulkan and a Geo renderer, and the Vulkan render is much faster, which is uh, very encouraging. Of course, the Geo rendering is based on on GL one, so it's not the most modern implementation, I guess. But uh, still, I think it's a good result uh, for those of you who know. Uh, Quick 3, you know there is also a GL2 renderer, but that's more of an experimental thing that adds a pile of other rendering features. So the performance actually works with that rendering, if, even if it's more, more modern. So that's why I think the comparison with the GL1 render is, is, is the best. Um, so uh, another thing we are aware of currently is there are some slow paths in the driver. Uh, we uh, noticed this particularly for some cases of transfer operations in Vulkan. Um, in fact, this was one of the things we worked on to improve the the, uh, the various Quake games when we work on that. But I think this is still ways for us to keep improving this. Uh, I think we should be going doing more of that going forward. Another thing is the, the hardware has this um, TFU unit, which is used to uh, basically convert and copy images around, uh, which we think we could probably use better in some areas. Um, unfortunately, uh, Vulkan um, allows, um, allows developers to do suballocation, which of course is a very nice technique for developers, but it's just something that doesn't work very well with our TFE unit because it allows basically suballocation means that you can create an image and, and then you can suballocate parts of that image to a smaller images. So you have this mega texture that and you then use the memory for that mega texture to hold multiple smaller uh, images as, as a way to kind of do your own uh, memory management. Um, and then you allow to uh, these smaller individual images to be copied, removed, added in different places uh, within that mega texture. And that's something that doesn't really work very well with our DFE unit because it requires, it, it only works with full images basically. Uh, but still, I think there is this room uh, for us to, to make better use of that in some cases. Okay, so now moving on to uh, implementation challenges. Um, so these are, kind of a collection of a few things that we had to be a bit more careful with when when running when bringing Vulkan to B3D. Um, uh, so one of them is, of course, Vulkan expects that everything that you do is going to execute in the GPU. Um, the idea is that you have this command buffer in which you record all, all your rendering comments. Then you submit that to a GPU queue. And then when that's done, it will signal, the GPU will signal uh, your, your host CPU uh, using um, uh, fans, for example. Um, and all this works really well for us as well, of course, uh, but there are very few selected cases where uh, there were specific things that we needed to do in the CPU uh, because our GPU just didn't work like that. Uh, off the top of my head, I remember the case, for example, for occlusion queries. So when you want to get the result from an occlusion query, uh, the Vulkan API allows you to just record a command into the command buffer where the GPU just writes the result of the query into a buffer that you can then access from the host of the GPU. And in our case, it, it just doesn't work like that. So the only way I think that we have to read the result of an occlusion query right now is to just uh, map the buffer, read the result, and then copy it in the CPU. Um, this is, in fact, what the what the OpenGL driver does. Um, so what this means is that for us, we need to kind of break the illusion um, internally that that everything is in the GPU and have these internal flashes in these cases 
to synchronize between the CPU and the GPU, do the CPU part of the of, of the work, and then resume the execution of the uh, common buffer in the GPU, which caused some implementation churn, of course. Uh, but it's, I think, inavoidable, at least in some of the cases that we have this problem. Uh, maybe in the future, the, some of these bits we could improve. Uh, I had some ideas for how to maybe make uh, uh, reduce this churn in, in a few cases. But I think it's maybe not possible to do this in exactly every single scenario. Uh, but as I said, this is just only a very few selected uh, scenarios, and I don't think it's a major cause of concern for us. Um, another thing that we um, have in the Raspberry Pi 4 is a display pipeline that can only handle linear images, uh, whereas our render pipeline cannot sample or texture from linear images at all. So um, funnily enough, the um, uh, Windows system bits CMESA for Vulkan assume that any of your swap chain images are going to be images that you can texture for, from by default. But that's not true in our case uh, because of this. Um, so we have to disable that feature uh, on, on, on the Pi 4 for now. Of course, when you are running inside a compositor uh, and inside a window and not your not full screen, you may be able to negotiate a tile layout for your searching images. But I wonder whether that's worth it or not, in the sense that uh, that basically means that when you switch between uh, full screen and window mode, it, it, the underlying capacities and capabilities of your surface are changing as well. I'm not sure if developers, that's in a scenario that developers expect, or if, if, even if it is worth it, because that it would also mean that it would require to do, um, to have an alternative implementation if they need to switch back and forth between these two modes. Um, so another thing that is very core to the Vulkan API design is uh, this idea that you have all your pipelines staying available upfront, so to avoid uh, pipeline uh, shadow recompiles uh, at throw time. Uh, and uh, this is a kind of one of the great ways in which Vulkan can improve the user experience. Um, and this works really well as well for us. Uh, however, there is uh, there is this one or two cases where we cannot exactly do this um, or not optimally um, because we don't have all the state that we need. Particularly in our platform, we would like to know uh, when a shader uses textures, we would like to know uh, the formats of these textures. Um, and this is something that we don't know un until we bind the script or sets later on, not when, we, when the pipeline is created. Uh, so the way we are dealing with that right now is we decide to pre-compile a few variants with the pipeline. Uh, so we have an optimal case that assumes that we can use a 16-bit return size for all, all the textures that we have. But we also compile a fallback case where we use 32-bit, which is maybe not as optimal, uh, but it is going to be uh, valid in all cases. Um, so uh, then when we actually bind the script or sets, we choose the one to use based on, on the formats that are actually bound at the time. Uh, of course, we could go uh, further into this strategy and, and produce all the combinations maybe, uh, and always choose the optimal case. But then we would be creating a lot of shader variants that we maybe not be using at all, and they would use memory. So. Uh, we sort of settled with this for now, uh, but this is an example of something that we may want to tweak um, a little bit going into the future as we start playing around with more applications and, and, and evaluate how this, how we can optimize these kind of things. For what is worth with the Vulcan, with the Vulcan uh, Quake games that we tested, this didn't seem to have any significant performance impact, maybe we would drop uh, half a frame per second or or maybe one, but not more than that. So we don't think this is a huge thing, but it's something that we would like to point out. Um, so yeah, the other thing is, uh, so Mesa has a Vulkan Windows system implementation that we can reuse in different drivers. Um, th there's, there are two paths implemented there when that is optimal uh, where your swap chain images are uh, sent directly to for a scan out, and the other one, which uh, which has acts as a fallback, where 
the images are converted to a linear buffer, and then the, it is the linear buffer that is sent for scan out. Uh, so the optimal implementation path requires that you have a PCI GPU uh, and the PCI bus info implemented in extension implemented in, in your Vulkan driver. So the Raspberry Pi display device is not PCI, of course. And um, uh, I think what we what we need there is just to make sure that the D3 device uh, matches the drivers. Uh, and in that case, we should be able to avoid the, the slower fallback path. So we have actually a, a request for comments, merge request on, on the upstream Mesa repository uh, to kind of gather uh, thoughts on this issue. Uh, we proposed something there that works for us. I recently up updated that solution. Uh, I would like to, to get a bit more feedback on, on whether that's the way to go for this. OK, so moving on to uh, future plans. So in the very short term, there is a couple of things uh, that are very important. Uh, of course, we are very close to uh, to conformance for Vulkan 1.0. I mentioned before that we are only maybe 20 tests away from, from achieving that. So that's something that we are working on and that we would like to see happening uh, this year. Uh, we also, the other thing that is very important to us is to move uh, the driver to to, to Mesa uh, and merge it there. Uh, as I said, for our own convenience, we have been working outside of the main tree uh, just because we could not offer a good, uh, I think, uh, developer workflow uh, as we wanted to you know, go back in history and amend things that, that, that we have done there in the past. Um, but I think the, the development context for the driver nowadays is much different. I think we are much more stable. We don't. I don't think we need to do that anymore or be concerned with that anymore. And I think working upstream directly nowadays makes a lot more sense. Um, I think the driver is also started now to be useful. It can run a few games. It can run a few demos. I think that's uh, what people would expect from from a driver in Mesa. Um, so I think we are in the right place to start that conversation. We have been discussing this internally this week already, and we have some thoughts on how. We can propose to do this that we hope to share even this week uh, with the with the main Mesa community through an email on Mesa the Bill. Uh, so look forward to that. So in the long term, uh, there is a lot more that we would be willing to explore. Uh, with no particular order in priority, uh, we one of the things that I already suggested is better TFE unit usage. I think that might improve performance in specific scenarios, um, at least when we are not suballocating resources. Uh, so I think there is maybe a few ways in which we can take advantage of that. And, and we are still we are already using the DFU unit in some cases, but not maybe as as thoroughly as we should. Uh, another thing we would definitely want to to work on is improving uh, Windows system integration. Uh, for right now, we are um, focusing only on on the X server uh, on X11 basically because that's the 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 Windows system used with um, with the Raspbian OS. Um, but uh, going forward, we would of course also want to support Wayland and even just display uh, because that's something that other people have been asking us for. So we definitely should get to do that at some point. Um, Another thing is, if you are familiar with Vulkan, uh, you know that um, there is this design element of the API where you have render passes and input attachments. And this was specifically designed to help uh, tiled GPUs, like the ones that you usually find in, in the better the space, uh, improve their performance in certain scenarios. Um, and we are not yet, our implementation does not yet uh, have an optimal implementation of this. Um, we are just taking input attachments to be uh, regular texture inputs uh, to a subpass, which doesn't take advantage of 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 the of the mechanism that Vulkan enables for embedded GPUs uh, to better to have a better use of the uh, data that is already on on your tile buffer. And I hope that we can get to do that at some point in the future. That optimization, we actually noticed that there is a game with a Quake Two that. 
users do this functionality of input attachments. So it would be nice to implement this and see how it affects our performance. Um, then, of course, there is a lot of optional features and extensions at the Pavoka 1.0 that we could implement that they would like to implement for sure. And as we make progress with that, we should also assess uh, if we can do Vulkan 1.1 or how much of it we can do. Uh, Vulkan 1.1 is something that we haven't really think about yet, uh, but we should definitely uh, have to do that at some point in the future. Another thing that we'd like to improve going forward is code reuse with the glass driver. Uh, so the philosophy that we followed during development is that we did not want to, uh, when we found uh, parts of the glass driver code that we could reuse in Vulkan, uh, we did not uh, opt for refactoring the glass driver at that point because um, the, the driver, the Vulkan driver was in a very early development stage. And so we, I don't think we had a good um, visibility on exactly how that code that we were refactoring would need to change for Vulkan. And we didn't want to start creating mesh requests for the class driver in Mesa and then continually have to be patching that as we made progress with Vulkan. And we also didn't want to keep the changes local to our fork because then as progress was made on, on AppStream Mesa on the class driver, then we would have to deal with that on our end uh, and complicated rebases. Uh, so with, we, we just took the, the code that we needed into Vulkan, made whatever changes we needed to make to adapt to whatever we needed to do in Vulkan. And I think now that we have a more mature driver, we're in a better position to assess um, how we can effectively reuse code and refactor that code to uh, be useful across both drivers. And I think that's a nice little project that we can run, hopefully mm, soon after we land the driver in Mesa. And then there is, of course, a lot of other features that we implemented in Vulkan that uh, could be ported to Glass. Uh, for example, one thing that I remember Eric had told us was uh, the Glass driver is not doing, uh, not using efficiently the hardware for multi-sample resolves. It's using a shader instead, but the Pi4 allows us to do that. Uh, so this is something that we did right for, for Vulkan and it should be straightforward to port it to glass. So we should do that. And then there is a few, a few other features like uh, sample rate shading or robust buffer access that we implemented for, for Vulkan that should be easy to enable or port to, to the glass stack. So we should definitely look into doing that as well. Uh, but I think that the most important thing for us right now is to get to test the driver with more real world applications and games, to get a real feeling for what is really working well, what doesn't work, uh, what is underperforming, and use all that feedback to continue to improve the driver, polishing the bits, uh, fix the implementation, uh, and, and, and polishing the bits that uh, we need to polish to improve performance. Okay, so um, now let's talk a little bit about how we can enable other people to contribute. So as I said in the beginning of this presentation, um, I think in the beginning of, of when we announced the, the effort to bring Vulkan to the Raspberry Pi 4, uh, we we're kind of uh, taking our first steps with the driver. The development there was, or the context was not uh, very friendly to, uh, uh, other contributors, I mean, there were a lot of moving pieces. Even internally, we have to be very careful about how we wanted to coordinate uh, so that we didn't step on each other's feet. Uh, and um, I think now that when we are arrived to May, I said that we had a lot more implemented and we started to have some, some, uh, some of the SSA Williams demos working. I think at that point, when we decided to move to an open repository for development, I think we started to change that that scenario. And I think today we are in a much better context to enable a satisfactory experience for other people to, to help us with the driver. Now, some people may be thinking that because we are close to a Vulkan 1.0 implementation that there isn't so much that needs to be done, but that's far from true. I just mentioned a few slides ago, um, some of the things that we, we still want to work on, and there's a lot of there, as you can see. Um, and there's more as, as, as I will uh, discuss right in a moment. But first I would like to address the fact that 
uh, as you probably know, the uh, Raspberry Pi 4 GPU doesn't have available documentation as of today. Uh, and like, and like the scenario for for the Raspberry Pi 3, um, um, some people may think that this is a a blocker for them to contribute, but I think that's not the case. Um, uh, thankfully, we we do have a class 3.3.1 open source driver available. I think that uh, this gives you a lot of information about how the GPU works. Um, in fact, I found myself uh, going back to the class driver code for reference when I needed something for Vulkan, then I would go to the technical documentation that we do have available for, for the GPU because it, it is a lot more convenient and it gives you actually a bit more information when you really look into it. So uh, even if it looks a bit more scary uh, than just having a technical documentation, I think um, people should not, uh, should like really appreciate the value that that we have in having an open source driver available to help them understand how things work. Um, and then um, as for how they can get involved other than some of the things that I already mentioned before, we were, when we were developing, we were adding a lot of fixments to the source code um, for a lot of different things from things that we could do better, uh, things where we could maybe improve performance, things where we could not do better just yet because we would need some other feature that we have not implemented today, um, but that we may implement in the future and then it would unblock maybe some other optimizations. Uh, things where we are not sure we are maybe making the best decision just yet. So there's a lot of things there um, and anyone can just read the source code and, and try to see if there is something for them. Of course, some of these may be trickier than others. Uh, maybe the full story for them is not so immediately obvious to everyone. So if someone comes across any of these and they want to work on something, I suggest that they just talk to us and we can give them a, all the background required for that uh, probably. So that at least they, they understand the effort that's required with these things. Um, and then of course, there are many optional features as I, uh, commented before uh, that are pending and, and people could work on them. And, and one of the things that we would definitely welcome would be testing and performance feedback. So just, just getting the driver, testing uh, some Vulkan games some Vulkan applications and letting us know what works, what testing, if the performance is decent or not. And then we can use all that feedback to try to figure out how to improve the driver. That is, that would be tremendous help to us as well. So if you are interested in, in doing any of these or you just want to ask questions about the driver or anything, here are a few resources we are hanging out on, on the video core channel at Freenode. So um, just join the channel, talk to us, ask questions. We will be happy to, to hear from you. Uh, then we are, of course, on, on Mesa Devil as well. Uh, so you can reach out to us there as well. And we can also interact through GitLab issues. Uh, right now on our own fork where we are developing the driver, uh, but hopefully not very far from now uh, in upstream Mesa directly. Now I have one last slide where I would like to uh, share special thanks to many developers who have directly or indirectly uh, helped us in this process. Um, first, um, the Mesa community for developing near not just developing, but continuously improving, optimizing it and adapting it for Vulkan. Obviously, uh, all that work has been super useful to us and we were able to just reuse a lot of it directly in our driver, um, making our lives a lot easier. Uh, this pair of translator, translator layer, of course, uh, that's also related to these. The Windows system integration bits that I mentioned before in my presentation, all these things made our lives uh, a lot easier and the development effort uh, is more than it would have, have otherwise been. Uh, even when you may think that Vulkan is a low level uh, implementation and there is less room for for sharing code than in GL, uh, well, that is true. I, I think there's still relevant stuff that we can reuse in Mesa. I'm, I'm very grateful that all the developers did all this work before so we can leverage that in our driver. Um, then um, even if uh, we have multiple Vulkan drivers in Mesa already and each one has its own target platform with its own quirks and its own uh, requirements, um, 
I think they were still, uh, despite that the, they were different platforms, very inspirational and useful to us. Uh, and the Radby and Turnip, uh, we would usually go to these drivers to have a look at how they solve specific problems, uh, how they implemented the specific things, and if they had to uh, attend to the same concerns or, or, or issues that we had on our platforms. And just having that code available is just great help in general. So I would like to, to thank everyone involved with the de development of these drivers explicitly. Uh, and then there are uh, two other people who I would like to thank especially, and these are Eric, who was the original developer of the Glass driver code. Uh, and obviously, as you can imagine, having a 3.1 Glass implementation uh, available just makes uh, uh, developing a Vulkan driver uh, for that same GPU a lot, lot easier. Um, so Eric solved a lot of the problems that we would have to solve for Vulkan. He solved them for OpenGL. Uh, so we could just take advantage of that. Yeah, I'm just finishing. And the other person I would like to to um, thank is Dave Emmett, an engineer for, from Broadcom, who is um, has been super helpful with us for those moments where you hit the bug in the GPU or something that doesn't match the documentation that we had or that was uh, not working as expected. He has been super helpful with us as well. So big thanks to him as well. And that's all. So I hear that we have some questions. Um, so, OK, good. So uh, the first question from IRC is, uh, have you considered compute shaders for occlusion queries? Uh, they do that in RADV uh, to uh, mangle all the query to buffer stuff, and it would avoid a CPU fallback. Oh, that's very, very interesting. No, actually, I didn't think about that. But yeah, that's, that's one thing that we should try, maybe. Yeah, thank you. OK, another question is, uh, have you tried running Zinc on top of this driver? No, I think someone else, I think Salvador from, from Raspberry Pi Labs asked us if there were any requirements specific. Uh, we haven't tried to do that yet. Uh, I, th I guess it would be an interesting experiment. I'm not sure exactly what are the requirements that Zinc has on the, on, on the Vulkan implementation. Uh, maybe now that we, have, that we are close to the Weno implementation, we, we, could, we would be close to that. Uh, we don't implement a lot of optional features and extensions, so maybe there is stuff that we are missing that they require. I guess it would be nice to know uh, how that works. OK, another question is, how much code can you share between your Vulkan driver and OpenGL driver, and how did you deal with the difficulties in doing so? Right. So one of the things that we could uh, share without any problem is the, the entire compiler backend. Uh, so all that is just just works the same. Uh, just we only had to add a few additional features uh, where uh, Vulkan has a specific intrinsics that we have to implement uh, that are specific to Vulkan. But the general uh, backend compiler is the same. Uh, the other things that we can reuse have to do, for example, with image layouting. So when you create an image and you have to decide uh, where in memory each of the mapmaps go and how big they are or alignments and uh, basically the layout of your mapmap chains and layers, all that we should be able to share, um, for example, and uh, yeah, th that kind of thing. OK. Uh, do you have any V3D GitLab CI runner set up to prevent regressions when things slot uh, upstream? Right. So uh, not just yet, but that is in, in the plans. So our plan there, which is um, a bit overdue at this point, is to uh, plug. We have an internal CI that we use for the, for the uh, Raspberry Pi uh, 4 class driver uh, that we want to plug to, to FDO. Uh, and we have been working, we have a colleague who has been working on that for a few months. Unfortunately, uh, that um, work is not just yet at the point where we can do that, but we hope to do that uh, soon, I guess. Uh, and then once we have that, we would like to expand our CI to also incorporate the the Vulkan driver uh, so that we get coverage for, for all the relevant drivers. Uh, there's a comment. Very good work. I'm really excited to see more Vulkan drivers. So there's more of us excited Great. about this. Thank you. And one new question that just appeared. Any plans putting uh, 
Uh, any plans on putting here the re reduced CTS test list in the CTS repo? So do you want to put the test list in the repo? Oh, um, yeah, I guess we could do that. We, we do have a internal repository with Piglet where we keep a list, uh, but I guess we could put that in the repo as well, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, I guess that was the last question. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. It was great and see you around. Okay, thank you. Enjoy XCC.